The Battle of Waterloo is the last act in a drama that begins with the French Revolution of 1789. Socially, politically, Europe is transformed and the other great powers of Europe have to cope with, first of all, the unpredictable nature of revolutionary France and later the expansionist ambitions of the great French general and later French emperor, Napoleon Bonaparte. Fortunes fluctuate to and fro. At one point in the early 19th century, Great Britain is in danger of invasion. Napoleon is planning an invasion fleet. When Britain was threatened with invasion in the first years of the 19th century, there was an outpouring from printers of uh, posters, leaflets, what were termed loyal papers, uh, with the aim of galvanising the population of Britain to uh, rise to the uh, threat that was being posed by Bonaparte. One which we're showing in the exhibition uh, is, is modelled on a playbill. There would have been bills advertising theatrical performances uh, all over London and, and in the provinces. Uh, and this uh, poster takes that model, but it's advertising Harlequin's Invasion or the Disappointed Banditti, which is a, a production which is, is going to star um, Mr Bonaparte from Corsica. Uh, he has previously murdered that part in uh, Egypt and Switzerland the Low Countries, places where uh, French arms have already been successful. And that danger only goes away thanks to British naval dominance and particularly the great naval victory at Trafalgar over the French and Spanish fleets, masterminded by Admiral Lord Nelson. On land, however, on land, Napoleon is still supreme. The tide begins to turn with Napoleon's ill-judged invasion of Russia in 1812. The French army is in short depleted and from that point onwards this war for France becomes a defensive war as Napoleon tries to hold back the allied nations, Russia, Prussia, Austria, Britain, ranged against him. He fails, he fails. By the spring of 1814 the Austrians and the Prussians are at the gates of Paris and the Russians are at the gates of Paris and Napoleon is persuaded to abdicate, to spare his country further suffering. The terms that he's offered aren't ungenerous. He's given effectively the rule of the little Mediterranean island of Elba off the coast of Italy. When Napoleon abdicated in 1814, Europe thought that an era of peace had dawned and in Britain they started celebrating it in some style. Um, there were informal gatherings in taverns but uh, the government decided that something central in, in London ought to be done and in August there was a, a, a fete and a series of events in the great London parks uh, to celebrate the arrival of what which was hoped was going to be a durable peace. In St James's Park there was a Chinese bridge built across the canal and a pagoda built on this bridge from which fireworks were shot and uh, this would have been quite spectacular. Unfortunately this, uh, rather tragically, um, ended up burning down just after midnight uh, and a workman lost his life uh, jumping from it. Of course what we now know, which they did not then, is that all these celebrations were premature. In February 1815, Napoleon leaves Elba secretly, sails for southern France with just a thousand loyal troops. He's bent on taking back his throne. Now, what does Napoleon do next? Well, he realises that he has to make peace with the other great European powers, but they're not having it. They've had too much experience of Napoleon's ambitions in the past, and they form a coalition against him. Napoleon has to act fast, so he strikes first. And what happens at Waterloo is that in a long battle which stretches through the afternoon and early evening on one of the longest days of the year, Wellington maintains his strong defensive position south of Waterloo. Napoleon cannot break him, cannot force him back uh, on Brussels. And Wellington holds his ground long enough for a Prussian army to join in the battle. They fall on the French right flank. And when that happens, weight of numbers tell Napoleon is doomed. The French flee 
the field. As dusk falls, Wellington and Blucher, exhausted, triumphant, meet. Blucher has very little English. He can only mutter, mein lieber Kamerad, and then he articulates what both he and Wellington evidently feel about this close-run thing. He says, quelle affaire. Waterloo very soon became a tourist attraction in the years after the battle. You didn't need to be taking a very grand tour of Europe. Even if you were just going through the Low Countries and Northern France, you could stop off at Waterloo on that itinerary. And a lot of people did. It was quite a well-visited site, even in the, uh, the months after the battle. We're displaying one book in the exhibition, which was produced by a man called Michael Edgerton, who went under the, uh, the pen name of Omnium Gatherum. And he visited uh, Waterloo and, and made numerous sketches of the battlefield, the monuments there, and uh, Ougoumont in particular, which was the um, farm complex on the right of Wellington's line, which was defended all day by the, uh, by the British and their allies. Uh, and was assaulted many times by the French, but, but never taken. He shows a party of visitors uh, going into the, the chapel, which was part of the, uh, the buildings at Hougoumont, and uh, records that one of them is writing her name on the wall, uh, where thousands of others have, have written their name before her. They visit the battlefield, they see all the sites, they take home souvenirs, and some of those souvenirs you'll find in the exhibition at Cambridge University Library. You'll also find telling evidence of the way that the battle still holds the popular imagination right across the continent for years afterwards. You'll see evidence of the way in which the confused story of a battle fought on a smoke-shrouded battlefield is simplified and streamlined and clarified for an eager audience.